Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner, we have now concluded the case studies for this module on small business lending. In closing, we will summarise the findings that we submit are open with respect to those case studies and pose various questions for submissions that we think will assist you in your further work. Before we turn to those case studies, we wish to say a little more about the process that preceded these hearings, including how we selected the case studies for this round of hearings for your consideration. In preparing for this round of hearings, we reviewed the over 630 public submissions that related to small and medium-sized enterprises. We also spoke to a wide range of interested stakeholders, including the Financial Services Ombudsman, Mr Curry, the Council of Small Business Organisations Australia, Financial Counselling Australia, the Legal Advice for Small Business Clinic, which is a joint initiative of the University of Canberra and ACT Legal Aid, Legal Aid New South Wales, Legal Aid Queensland and the Consumer Action Law Centre. In addition, we spoke to a range of statutory and government bodies about policy and regulation in relation to small business lending, and that included ASIC, the ACCC, APRA, the Small Business Ombudsman and Treasury. We issued six 164 notices to produce, which returned over 75,000 documents. Based on this work, we identified and interviewed more than 40 individual borrowers about their experiences in relation to business lending to identify and select the most appropriate case studies for consideration by the Commission during the oral hearings. The Commission in the last two weeks has heard evidence from selected borrowers or consumers in nine of the case studies, along with other case studies that have not included a consumer witness. We selected individual borrowers whose stories we thought would allow you to best explore and examine the issues presented in relation to lending to small and medium enterprises. As we think these case studies have demonstrated, the dealings between any small business borrower and a financial services entity is almost always complicated. The relationship with the bank intersects and is intertwined with the operation of the business and often also the personal financial situation of the individual or individuals behind the business. In all of the case studies involving individual borrowers, and indeed for all of the individual borrowers with whom we spoke in advance of these hearings, the causes of the failure or deterioration in the performance of the business were multifaceted. But fundamentally, the problems had their roots in the performance of the business rather than anything else. Now that does not mean that the failure was through some fault of the borrower. It simply reflects that the performance of a business is dependent upon many factors. Many businesses are dependent upon the general state of the economy. If there is a general deterioration in the economy, for example, the GFC, many businesses will suffer and some may not survive. But small businesses are also subject, like all other businesses, to risks specific to the business. Renovations at a shopping centre might drive down foot traffic and put a business operating at the centre to or over the edge. In this closing address, we will deal with each of the case studies of part, as part of six particular topics. And those topics are first, responsible lending, second, guarantees by third parties, third, consumer redress systems, fourth, the Bankwest Business Lending Book, fifth, power and communication, and sixth, and finally, regulation and self-regulation. For each of the case studies, we will identify the findings that we as council assisting regard as being open on the evidence, or if we consider it to be the case, findings which are not reasonably open. We will invite the entity involved in the case study to respond with written submissions. Perhaps of greater or much greater importance in this module is that we will also identify more general questions that arise in relation to these topics. And all parties with leave to appear will be invited to provide written responses to those general questions. Can I turn then to the first topic, which is responsible lending? 
And Commissioner, as we foreshadowed in the opening, one of the overarching questions that you will need to consider is what obligations in relation to responsible lending, if any, ought to apply in relation to small business lending? Should the obligations in relation to small business lending differ from the obligations that apply with respect to consumer lending? For reasons we will expand upon in a moment, Commissioner, our submission is that the answer that you ought to arrive at is that no additional statutory obligations should be imposed with respect to the making of loans to small businesses. But before we reach that general level, we will deal with each of the three relevant case studies. The first case study concerns irresponsible lending by ANZ. The Commission heard evidence from Ms Kate Gibson of ANZ. In 2014, a company operated by a husband and wife whose names are the subject of a non-publication direction, sought facilities from ANZ of about $220,000 in order to purchase a gelato franchise. They relied upon cash flow forecasts that, it appears, had been provided by the franchisor. The loan was secured by a number of guarantees and indemnities, including a second mortgage over the investment property of one of the partners. In 2016, the company made a complaint to FOS. One of the bases for this complaint was that the borrowers could not afford to repay the loan. FOS made a recommendation in favour of the, bor of the borrower company. And in doing so, one of the things that FOS considered was that ANZ had relied on projected cash flow forecasts that were overly optimistic. ANZ disagreed at the time and continues to disagree with this recommendation for this reason, for, on the basis of that reason. FOS subsequently issued a determination in favour of the borrowers. Ms Gibson's evidence was that ANZ continues to disagree with FOS's determination, but ANZ has in fact complied with the determination. Ms Gibson gave evidence that when a banker submits a loan for a start-up business, the ANZ banker is required to form an opinion as to the reasonableness of the business plan and the cash flow forecast provided in support of the loan application. The Commission heard evidence that the cash flow forecasts that were relied upon in this case were contained in a business plan which was very generic in nature and that there were inconsistencies between the various cash flow forecasts contained in the business plan. <coughs> Ms Gibson's evidence was that in the circumstances of this case study, she would have expected the banker responsible for this loan to have a conversation with the customer to make sure that the borrower understood the business. Ms Gibson was not aware of whether the banker had had this conversation with the customers in this case, and there was nothing in the file notes to suggest that this had occurred. Ms Gibson told the Commission that, having considered the whole of the loan application in relation to this case study, her opinion was that in assessing and approving the loan, ANZ had not exercised the skill and care of a prudent and diligent banker. At the time <coughs> that this loan was entered into, three of the four KPIs used in ANZ's incentive scheme focused on financial targets. During this period, that is during the period that the loan was made, the key message given by ANZ to its bankers was to relentlessly acquire new to bank customers. The Commission heard evidence that in the period immediately prior to the loan, in this case study being approved, the banker involved had not met his new to bank lending targets. This banker was later subject to performance management for unrelated loans and the Commission heard evidence that during this performance management process, the banker stated that his conduct was in part due to the excitement of closing new deals a culture of sales pressure that you felt weighted heavily at the time. Ms Gibson gave evidence that ANZ has since rebalanced its KPIs to have less of a financial focus. Now on the evidence and having regard to Ms Gibson's acknowledgement, it is open to you Commissioner to find that in assessing and approving the loan, the subject of this case study, ANZ may have failed to exercise the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker as required by Clause 27 of the Code of Banking Practice. But it should be emphasised 
that Ms Gibson was not agreeing with the reason for the FOS conclusion. Rather, Ms Gibson, who was obviously a very careful and very competent banker, was expressing dissatisfaction with the number of errors that she had picked up on her review of the file. ANZ is invited to provide written submissions addressing the finding we have identified to be open to the Commissioner, as well as any other findings that it regards as available on the evidence. The second responsible lending case study is concerned with the failure of a pie face franchisee. The Commission heard evidence from Ms Marion Messiah and Mr Alistair Welsh of Westpac. Ms Messiah and her brother and sister-in-law, trading through a company called Marjo, borrowed $362,500 from Westpac to purchase an existing pie face franchise located in Werribee Plaza using two residential properties as security. Ms Messiah and her business partner received advice from an accountant prior to entering the loan. And that advice cast doubt on the business profitability, but they chose to press ahead in the belief that through hard work, they could make the business profitable. Westpac was also aware of these assessments and considered them as part of the loan prior to purchase of the franchise. Marjo began trading in August of 2012. The business struggled and major renovations at the plaza from late 2013 caused sales to decrease. Despite working hard, the business was never profitable and by early 2014, <coughs> Marjo could not make its repayments to Westpac. In November 2014, Pie Face went into voluntary administration and at that point in time, Marjo shut the store. Marjo took a dispute to FOS, claiming that it should not have been given the loan by Westpac. FOS agreed and all interest and bank charges were removed from the loan. However, the principal remained to be paid and Ms Messiah sold her investment property in order to pay down the loan. Despite FOS's determination, Mr Welsh of Westpac disagreed with the basis of FOS's assessment that the loan should not have been made. Mr Welsh gave evidence about Westpac's accredited franchise program, which is intended to manage risks of lending to franchisees through obtaining information from the accredited franchisor about its business model and fiscals. Mr Welsh gave evidence that the franchise policy is a risk-based management approach and lending outside the franchise policy, as occurred in Marjo's case, is a risk-based decision for the bank. The presence of other incomes and the giving of security over residential property mitigated that risk in the case of Marjo. After Ms Messiah had sold her investment property, she made a second complaint to FOS about Westpac applying the entirety of the proceeds of the sale to pay down the loan. The second complaint was not determined in her favour. That finding suggested that Ms Messiah did not fully understand the nature of the guarantee, which was a joint and several one, that she had given. FOS did, however, find that Westpac had breached FOS's terms of reference in sending Ms Messiah 13 text messages relating to arrears on one of her accounts during the period 17 November 2016 to 3 December 2016. The sending or receipt of all of those text messages caused Ms Messiah to feel overwhelmed and stressed. Westpac admitted that the sending of collection notices to Ms Messiah while her second FOS dispute was on foot breached FOS's terms of reference. Westpac also admitted in relation to these collection notices that regardless of the existence of the FOS complaint, it was inappropriate for this many automatic collections messages to be sent to a customer in such a short period of time. Mr Welsh had looked into why the text messages had been sent and his evidence was that it was because the relevant loan had not been flagged as being subject to a FOS dispute. Of course, this suggests that but for the FOS dispute, the automated sending of these text messages would occur. There was no evidence adduced by Westpac to date to adequately explain whether this is a normal practice for Westpac or if it is not, whether Westpac has investigated its system to determine why this would occur where there was no FOS flag. On the evidence, the following findings may be open to you, Commissioner. First, 
Westpac breached Clause 3.2 of the Code of Banking Practice in failing to act fairly and reasonably towards Ms Messiah in a consistent and ethical manner by continuing to undertake collections activities against Ms Messiah after Ms Messiah had made a complaint to FOS. Second, in continuing to undertake collection activities against Ms Messiah after Ms Messiah had made her complaint, Westpac breached its obligations as a member of FOS under Clause 13.1 of the FOS Terms of Reference. Westpac is invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings that we have identified and any other findings that it regards as being reasonably open on the evidence. In addition, Westpac is also invited to provide written submissions on the question of whether Westpac has adequate systems in place to ensure compliance with its obligations under the Code of Banking Practice and the FOS Terms of Reference with respect to collection activities. The third case study, relevant to responsible lending, concerns a business loan from the Bank of Queensland to a company operated by Sue Riches for the purpose of purchasing two Wendy's franchise outlets in Adelaide. The Commission heard evidence from Ms Riches, as well as from Mr Douglas Snell, General Manager of Performance, Product and Governance at Bank of Queensland. In early 2012, Ms Riches and her husband decided to buy the Wendy's outlets at a Westfield shopping centre in order to secure their financial future. Ms Riches consulted with an advisor about the purchase of the business, who told her that the bottom line profit looked skinny. Ms Riches' evidence was that she was confident that she could improve the profits of the business, and she proceeded to sign a contract of sale based on a conditional letter of offer from Bank of Queensland. The conditional letter of offer stated that the indicative monthly repayments would be $4,420 over 84 months. Ms Riches also signed a Wendy's franchise agreement prior to being provided the final letter of offer from Bank of Queensland. Bank of Queensland's final letter of offer, when it was provided, stated that the monthly repayments were almost double, well over $8,000, those in the offer letter, in the conditional offer letter that had been provided, and the term was only three years. Ms Riches gave evidence that she felt stuck between a rock and a hard place with no way to get out of the contract, and so she accepted Bank of Queensland's offer. The business, Ms Rich's business, found it very difficult to make the monthly repayments, and it was quickly in default. Eventually, it was liquidated. In 2014, FOS found that Bank of Queensland had misled Ms Rich's about the size of the monthly repayments, and that there had been maladministration by Bank of Queensland in respect of the loan. Despite Bank of Queensland having already concluded internally that it had engaged in irresponsible lending, Bank of Queensland contested the complaint before FOS. Mr Snell conceded that this was inappropriate. Mr Snell also conceded that Bank of Queensland's failure to acknowledge the maladministration was neither fair nor reasonable to Ms Riches. Mr Snell also gave evidence about the incentive structure for Bank of Queensland's owner-manager branches which constitute just over 60% of Bank of Queensland's branches. The Commission heard that, in 2012, the level of compliance in owner-manager branches was low, although efforts had been made to improve this. Mr Snell was not aware of how it would be possible for Bank of Queensland's owner remuneration model, which functions principally on the basis of commission, to align with the Sedgwick recommendations. Mr Snell said, that this was a matter still under consideration by Bank of Queensland. On the evidence, it is open to the Commission to find that Bank of Queensland breached Clause 27 of the Code of Banking Practice in failing to exercise the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker in its approval and assessment of the Sue Rich business loan. Further, bank, it is open to find that Bank of Queensland breached Clause 3.1b of the Code in failing to promote an informed decision of Ms Riches by failing to provide effective and timely disclosure of the repayment amount and the term of the loan. And finally, it is open to find that Bank of Queensland may have breached Clause 3.2 of the Code in failing to act fairly and reasonably towards Sue Rich in contesting the FOS complaint, despite being aware of the maladministration in the inception of the loan. Bank of Queensland is invited to provide written submissions
addressing each of the findings that we have identified, Commissioner, as well as any other findings that it regards as available on the evidence. In addition, a question that arises in this particular case study is as to the likely consequences of owner-manager branches of Bank of Queensland being recipients of trailing or other commissions, particularly having regard to the findings of the Sedgwick report into retail banking remuneration. Bank of Queensland and all parties with leave to appear are invited to make written submissions in response to that question. Now, having addressed those three particular case studies, Commissioner, we will now turn to the general questions in relation to responsible lending. In all three franchise cases, questions were raised as to the scrutiny of the projected cash flow assessment or past cash flow provided to support the loan application, both by the lender but also by the borrower. We wish to make some observations, Commissioner, as to views that would be open to you about cash flow projections and the personal responsibility of borrowers. These observations ought to be tested and we will frame at the conclusion of these observations some general questions to do so. In all three cases, banks were lending on the basis of the potential income of the business as what is often referred to as the first way out for the loan. The second way out is the security provided by the borrower or guarantor. The potential income is based on the projections made by or on behalf of the borrower. And in one of the cases we looked at, the projections came from the borrower's accountant. In another case, the projections came from the franchisor, from whom the borrower planned to enter into a franchise agreement. And in the third case, the serviceability assessment was based on the profit and loss statements of the vendor of the business. Under the code of banking practice, banks are required to act with prudence and diligence in assessing small business loan applications. Of course, it might be thought that banks would also wish, in respect of all learning, lending, to act as prudent and diligent bankers. And one way of understanding the standard that is imposed by the code of banking practice might be that the bank ought to act to satisfy itself to a reasonable standard that the borrower will be able to repay the credit facility. That is to say, the prudent and diligent banker is acting in order to protect the bank. The bank is not warranting the success of the borrower's business, nor is the bank acting as an advisor to the business borrower, and nor can it ex be expected to be. In each of the three cases, the borrower was relying upon some third party for advice and assistance. In one case, the third parties were an accountant and a franchisor. In another case, the third parties were a broker and the franchisor. And in a third case, the third parties were an accountant and a lawyer. Those are the people to whom the borrower can turn and ought to turn for advice and assistance in decision making. Now, we acknowledge that in many cases, this very legal way of looking at things and the relationships between the borrower and third parties and the borrower and the bank might be undermined by the nature of the relationship that banks want to encourage with their customers being one of trust and partnership, evidenced by slogans promising that we're here to help or support your business every step of the way or it's possible to love a bank. But slogans are not legal obligations, though they no doubt contribute to the expectations of the community as to the role and nature of the bank and its relationship with the customer. In all three of the cases, the business has failed not because of some issue reflective of a very technical flaw in the loan assessment, such as the interest rate rising outside of a particular buffer that had been used in the calculation of serviceability, but rather the business failed because fundamentally the performance of the business did not live up to the projections that were presented to the bank and the hopes and the aspirations of the borrower. Small business entrepreneurs are, by their nature, optimistic about the ability of their business to succeed. Any increase in regulatory requirements on banks 
to scrutinise the optimism of a small business borrower must necessarily be premised on the proposition that the banks are too willing to make loans to small business. Neither the case studies nor the work that we have done outside of the hearings suggests that this is the case. It follows that our submission is that it is not open to you to conclude that it is necessary or desirable to increase the obligations of banks making small business loans so as to make those obligations akin to or similar to or more like the responsible lending obligations imposed by the National Credit Act. Nevertheless, we acknowledge that this is not a view that is universally held, and as we indicated in opening, more regulation was contemplated some years ago. All parties with leave to appear are invited to provide written submissions addressing the following three questions, which arise from the three case studies in relation to the applications for business loans and serviceability assessments. Question one, how much responsibility does the borrower and lender bear in assessing the cash flow forecasts and other factors when deciding whether to enter into the loan contract? Question two, what are the outer limits of a bank's duty to act as a prudent and diligent banker in assessing a business loan application? Should that outer limit or should the outer limit of this duty be codified? Question well, three. It's, it's not just outer limit, it's content more generally, I think. Yes, Commissioner. I think what exactly is the content of the duty of prudent and diligent banker? Uh, you observed that uh, uh, in its expression, it appears to uh, speak of the relationship that the banker owes to the banker's employer. But then how does that duty, which uh, is one level uh, understandable vis-a-vis -vis employer, what is its content when it is said as it is in the code of banking practice that we owe you, that is to say, the potential borrower and also, as we'll come to, the potential guarantor, we owe you the duty to act as a prudent and diligent banker. So what's the content? What are the limits? Yes, and yeah. just, that's right, so there's there's an important distinction that needs to be drawn there between, on the one hand, the duty that is imposed under the code of banking practice is a duty to act as the prudent and diligent banker. The consequence of it being part of the code and therefore part of the contractual obligations is that there is then a contractual obligation to the borrower that the banker will act as such. So there's two slightly different issues there. One is the nature of the obligation to the borrower the other is the nature of the content of the duty. And as I understand it, Commissioner, what you're emphasising is it's important that those people given leave to appear address that part about what exactly is the content of this standard, but perhaps guided by the fact that it's also a duty that is then imposed and an obligation to the borrower. Commissioner, the third it's question... It's an area which uh, is too readily... Uh, slipped over with a series of statements where uh, it's the content of the particular statement that is masking the real underlying issue. Yes. <coughs> Commissioner, the third general question is should any provision, any of the provisions of the National Credit Act, which apply to consumer credit contracts, also apply to credit contracts with small and medium-sized business customers? If so, why? And to which small and medium-sized business customers? If not, why not? In answering particularly the last question posed, we suggest that it would be particularly helpful for you to receive submissions addressing the effect that the imposition of such obligations would have on the provision of credit to small and medium-sized business customers and by reference to the specific obligations arising from the National Credit Act in relation to consumer lending. In this, as in most of the areas of the general questions, it's important to understand them as questions. They are not interrogative statements of opinion already formed. On the contrary, they are questions that are to be addressed and considered 
according to whichever side of the argument uh, the particular party uh, seeks to put itself. It's not going to be useful if somebody says, oh, the question was framed in this way, therefore uh, the underlying opinion is X, therefore I needn't uh, address that opinion. That's not the basis on which the questions are being put. They are not interrogative statements of opinion. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner, before we leave the topic of responsible lending, we wish to also address the case study concerning the Commonwealth Bank's overdrafts. And that case study concerned two related issues. First, the responsible lending practices of CBA in the course of the development of its simple business overdraft product. And secondly, a systemic issue which resulted in CBA charging over double the interest rate on both business overdrafts and also, and also the SBOs or simple business overdrafts and the way in which CBA responded to this issue, including remediating affected customers. Mr Van Horen, Executive General Manager of Retail Products within the Retail Banking Services Division at CBA, gave evidence in relation to both of these matters. As to the first issue, the responsible lending practice, I'll briefly outline the relevant facts. Between March and December 2012, CBA ran a pilot program of offering simple business overdrafts to existing business customers of CBA. These customers were selected based on a methodology that assessed them as a low risk of default by considering various criteria, including their recent banking with CBA. A pre-assessed overdraft facility was offered to over 10,000 CBA customers through a mass mail out in 2012. The Commission heard evidence that in 2012, CBA offered this product in circumstances where there was no genuine assessment as to whether these customers wanted an overdraft facility and the income or expenses of these customers and whether they could afford to repay the loan. This conduct arose because CBA considered that the SBO product would better meet the needs of small business customers without inquiring into the individual circumstances of each person. During the pilot program of the SBO offers to small business customers, there was no verification of income and expenses, but that was later changed in 2015 once the product was offered more widely. The automated pre-assessed offers during the pilot program were made in circumstances in which the customers were not asked whether they wanted an overdraft, and therefore CBA took an approach that it could not take if the business was a consumer rather than a business. Consistent with this approach during the pilot program, the SBO product was priced to reflect the risk to CBA from choosing not to verify the income and expenses of small business customers before offering the SBO. Commissioner, we do not submit that it is open to find that this conduct is either below community standards or in breach of clause 27 of the Code of Banking Practice nor do we suggest that it is open to find that there were otherwise breaches of the law by reason of CBA's conduct during this period. But the second issue is CBA's overcharging of its overdraft customers. Between December 2011 and March 2017, CBA overcharged some of its business customers with overdraft accounts by charging them 33.94% monthly interest rather than the correct interest rate of 16%. The conduct affected 337 BOD customers and 2,354 SBO customers. All BOD customers and 1,490 SBO customers were remediated by 6 July 2017 in an amount of just under $3 million. By reason of a change in CBA's position, which occurred only during the Royal Commission, there will be some further remediation of customers now where they were incorrectly charged amounts of less than $5. All affected business customers had been sent various bank statements over time which were misleading or false in that they misstated the amount of interest payable. CBA first discovered a pricing defect with SBOs in August 2013 as a result of a customer complaint. <coughs> 
CBA implemented a low level and manual fix without inquiring as to whether the scale of the problem was larger than one customer. The overdraft conduct was also discovered to affect BODs in November 2013. CBA did not implement a system fix until May 2015. This fix was not effective. In 2015, five customers approached CBA with complaints about being overcharged on their overdraft accounts. At that time, CBA did not investigate whether the overcharging issue applied to business accounts more broadly. One customer later lodged a complaint with FOS, which was the catalyst for the issue being elevated to Mr Van Horen. The Commission heard evidence that, following the FOS complaint in 2016, CBA investigated whether the overcharging issue affected business accounts more broadly. It did. The remediation program took an average of 960 days, or over two and a half years, from the commencement of the overcharging issue to the completion of the remediation for affected customers. The amount of remediation was $913,147 in respect of BOD customers and $2,075,417 for SBO customers. CBA did not notify the board in 2013 when the overcharging issue was first discovered or in 2015 and 2016 when further customer complaints were made and CBA investigated the issue across all accounts. However, the CEO of CBA met with ASIC on 15 May 2018 and one of the issues discussed was the overcharging issue. Both retail banking services and the institutional banking and markets divisions considered the question of whether ASIC ought be notified pursuant to section 912 capital D of the Corporations Act of a breach of the financial services law, each forming the view that it was unnecessary to do so. As matters transpired, eight days prior to Mr Van Horen giving evidence, CBA did notify ASIC that there had been a breach of section 12 capital D capital A of the ASIC Act by reason of the fact that in providing statements which inaccurately set out the amount of interest payable, CBA had misled or deceived its customers. Commissioner, the following findings may be open to you on those facts. First, consistent with the notification made by CBA, it will be open to you to conclude that the conduct of CBA may have constituted a contravention of Section 12 capital D capital A of the ASIC Act. Secondly, despite being aware of the issue as early as 2013, CBA failed to notify ASIC of this issue pursuant to Section 912 capital D of the Corporations Act until 15 May 2018, well in excess of the requirements under Section 912 D subsection 1b to inform ASIC as soon as possible and within 10 business days. Thirdly, as Mr Van Horen's evidence demonstrated, each time that CBA sent a statement that said that the interest rate was 16%, when in fact the interest rate being charged was much higher, CBA made a false or misleading representation as to the price of the financial services that CBA was providing. Mr Van Horen conceded that at least 25,000 such statements were sent. It might well be thought that it is open to find that the sending of each of those statements constituted a contravention of Section 12, capital D, capital B, subsection 1G of the ASIC Act, which prohibits false or misleading representations with respect to the price of financial services. And importantly, Commissioner, as we heard in evidence this morning, unlike a contravention of section 12 capital D capital A, which CBA has acknowledged, a contravention of section 12 capital D capital B can attract a pecuniary penalty. And no doubt that is a matter that ASIC will consider in light of the notification. CBA is invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings that we have identified to be open as well as any other findings that it regards as available in the evidence. Commissioner, we will now turn to consider the second topic of interest, 
which is the taking of a guarantee from a third party for a business loan. The relevant case study commissioner concerned Carolyn Flanagan, who provided a guarantee to Westpac and a mortgage over her home in order to secure a business loan obtained by a company established by her daughter and her daughter's partner. Ms Flanagan was on a disability pension and suffers from a number of serious medical conditions, including cancer, removal of, her of part of her tongue in 2004, macular degeneration and poor eyesight for the last 10 years, all of which were present at the time that she attended a Westpac branch with her daughter. Ms Flanagan gave evidence that in signing the guarantee, she had to have someone read out the documents due to her inability to read them herself. Some facts on the evidence available were unclear. Westpac's documentation is inadequate. The most likely chain of events is that Ms Flanagan ultimately signed the guarantee and mortgage on about 10 December 2010 in the presence of a solicitor. However, Ms Flanagan did so in circumstances in which a Westpac banker had compromised the process that was intended to ensure that she received independent advice. That banker had pre-filled in the answers to the various questions necessary to ensure that Ms Flanagan was properly advised and understood the guarantee. Remarkably, Mr Welsh, who gave evidence to the Commission, said that it was not uncommon for such forms to be pre-filled. The banker had also pre-signed, purportedly as a witness, both the guarantee and the mortgage. Westpac commenced action seeking the sale of Ms Flanagan's home after the borrowers defaulted under the business loan. Ms Baglari from New South Wales Legal Aid gave evidence to the Commission that she assisted Ms Flanagan in respect of that claim, including by way of a complaint to false. Ms Baglari sought an outcome that would allow Ms Flanagan to remain in her home until Ms Flanagan died. Westpac rejected that request at FOS and FOS reached a determination that was not in Ms Flanagan's favour. However, Westpac subsequently accepted a settlement offer after New South Wales Legal Aid contacted a senior person, or a senior contact at Westpac. Mr Welsh admitted that Westpac ought to have progressed the hardship request earlier. However, he did not see a problem with Westpac accepting a guarantee from Ms Flanagan in the first place, nor with the application of Westpac's policies. Mr Welsh agreed that there were warning signs that the banker ought to have observed. While Westpac's policy required Ms Flanagan to have a direct benefit, the evidence was that she had no real direct interest in the business and was not an employee during a wage. Well, is there anything that suggests that she had any indirect benefit in the business? The indirect benefit, put as highly as it can possibly be put, is that she was registered as a shareholder of the business, as a $1 shareholder of a company of which Westpac did not possess the constitution of a proprietary company where there was no suggestion that there would ever be a dividend paid. Not immediately apparent to me, and Westpac no doubt will tell me why uh, Ms Flanagan's case differs in any relevant respect from that considered in Garcia, where Mrs Garcia was treated as a volunteer. Yeah. Indeed, Commissioner, and perhaps if we can add to that, notwithstanding that the loan was to purchase a business, it was not possible to identify from Westpac's records how much precisely the business cost or what proportion of the loan amount was used to purchase the business. <coughs> On the face of Westpac's documents, the submission that we make is that it is open to find that no reasonable person could have been satisfied that Ms Flanagan had any meaningful direct or indirect interest in the business. Commissioner, we also submit that it is open to you to find on the evidence that Westpac may have contravened section 12 capital C capital B of the ASIC Act, which prohibits unconscionable conduct by accepting and relying upon a guarantee from Ms Flanagan, or may have generally engaged in unconscionable conduct in circumstances in which a, Westpac was in a superior bargaining position to Ms Flanagan. B, Ms Flanagan's personal circumstances included that she was on a disability pension, otherwise without an income, unable to read and of poor health, 
see Westpac's records suggest that it made inadequate efforts to identify any real interest of Ms Flanagan in the loan, notwithstanding that this was the premise upon which it took the guarantee. And D, Westpac's own employee compromised the process intended to ensure that Ms Flanagan gave informed consent to her entry into the guarantee and was properly advised as to the obligations that she was taking on. On the evidence, Commissioner, Go on. it is also open for you to find that the following conduct may have amounted to conduct below community standards and expectations. First, Westpac's acceptance and reliance upon the guarantee. Second, Westpac's failure to respond to Ms Flanagan's request for a life interest in a timely and reasonable way, which Westpac admitted that it ought to have acted more promptly on. And thirdly, Westpac's continued insistence that its behaviour in taking the guarantee from Ms Flanagan was acceptable. Just on this question of compromising the process about independent advice, uh, it may have a couple of aspects, and I don't pretend for the moment to try to identify them all, but one aspect that may or may not be worth considering is, what is a third party uh, to make of uh, the documents if they uh, are called on to consider them after the death of Miss Flanagan? Let it be assumed that the executor of her estate uh, upon her death uh, was to be met with a claim on the guarantee. Let it be further assumed that the bank supplies to the executor the whole of its file, uh, disclosing the circumstances uh, in aid of uh, a proposition that uh, Ms Flanagan uh, was advised to and did seek uh, independent advice. What is the third party to know, in this case the executor, to know about what the bank has done, what the bank officer has done, in, as I think Mr Welsh may have said, helpfully filling out the form before uh, it is taken to the solicitor? The third party will know nothing of those things, will they? That's right, Commissioner. Yes. These documents are bankable documents. Uh, forms and solemnities are there to be observed for a reason. Yes. Commissioner, Westpac is invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings that we have identified to be open as well as any other findings that it regards as available on the evidence. Now, Commissioner, can we say the case study throws up a more general issue about the circumstances in which a bank accepts a guarantee from a third party, particularly as has been identified by Legal Aid New South Wales and Legal Aid Queensland, the guaranteeing of a child's business borrowings by a parent? Before we frame some more general questions, <coughs> We would make the following observations as to matters that it might be open to you to find. First, there are established equitable principles in relation to unconscionability, as outlined in cases including Armadio and Garcia, to which you have referred, Commissioner, that will protect guarantors. Secondly, there is also a national statutory pro prohibition on, on unconscionable conduct in relation to financial services. Thirdly, there may be statutory remedies available for contracts made in New South Wales under the Contracts Review Act. Fourthly, following from the first three points, there is therefore an established set of legal protections capable of being relied upon by a person in the position of Ms Flanagan. The first general question is, is there any inadequacy or gap in those established projects? protections? If so, what is it? If not, would the protections apply in the case of Ms Flanagan and Commissioner, you have already raised the question for Westpac specifically as to whether Garcia would apply. The fifth observation is this. All of the legal protections to which we have referred operate necessarily after the event and depend upon successfully seeking the intervention of a court 
to prevent reliance by the financial institution on the guarantee. The difficulty that creates is apparent from the case of Ms Flanagan. Had Legal Aid New South Wales not persisted and been able to rely upon their contacts in other parts of Westpac, what could Ms Flanagan have done? How feasible would it be for Ms Flanagan, represented by Legal Aid, to run a case against Westpac? Against that background, the result achieved by Legal Aid New South Wales was excellent. It gave Ms Flanagan what she desired, which was the right to stay in her house. Sixthly, requiring a guarantor to have a direct interest in a business borrowing is unlikely, that is requiring by statutory intervention, a guarantor to have a direct interest in a business borrowing is unlikely to be the answer. If a parent wishes to guarantee a borrowing out of love and affection, then why should that parent, so long as fully informed and consenting, not be able to do so? Well, Ms Flanagan's evidence was if a parent can't help a child, who can? That's right. Yeah. And in addition, as Westpac's behaviour amply illustrates, the test of direct interest or benefit is open to being applied in a manner that is meaningless and process driven. Seventhly, it might be thought that the answer to the problem then is to require a guarantor to have independent legal advice. But the question then arises, is it possible for a solicitor to give sufficiently substantive advice that goes beyond merely explaining that the documents are legal documents and have legal consequences without additional information? Would requiring banks to provide additional financial information to a solicitor advising a guarantor, such as information concerning serviceability, address that problem? It might increase the burden on the solicitor advising the guarantor that the legal profession is well regulated and has professional indemnity insurers with an economic interest in ensuring good practice in relation to issues such as these. Having regard to those observations, the second question to which all parties with leave to appear are invited to provide written submissions has two parts. First, is it desirable to take steps to increase the likelihood that a third party guarantor of business borrowings will be properly advised and make an informed decision before entering into a guarantee? And if so, what might those steps be? Secondly, what difficulties would be created for banks or borrowers by steps that require more information to be provided to legal or financial advisors of a guarantor before the guarantee is signed? Commissioner, the third topic that we will address is consumer redress systems. Suncorp's dealings with the Lowe's is a case study that explored this topic. This case study concerned the treatment by Suncorp of Jennifer Lowe and her son Ryan Lowe. The Commission heard evidence from Ryan Lowe, David Carter, the CEO of the Banking and Wealth Division at Suncorp, and Philip Field, the lead ombudsman, Banking and Finance at FOS. Mr Lowe's father passed away in November 2015 in a workplace accident, leaving approximately a million dollars in outstanding loans including business loans with Suncorp. The loans were granted in 2013 and 2014. Mr Lowe's father had been the sole breadwinner and his mother had limit, limited income with which to service the loans. In 2017, FOS determined that the final business loan of $240,000, which was granted to the Lowe's in 2014, constituted irresponsible lending for reasons that included a failure to make proper inquiries into the purpose of the loan. FOS determined that the debt should be reduced by the amount of interest paid and that Suncorp should not be permitted to charge further interest. The determination specified that if the parties were unable to reach an agreement for repayment of the debt within 30 days of a proposal being made by Mr Lowe, Suncorp could be entitled to commence recovery action. A series of offers and counter-offers about repayment of the debt were made between the Lowe's and Suncorp. 
the Lowe's offered to continue to make the minimum or slightly higher loan repayments free of interest in accordance with the FOS determination over the original time frame of the loan. Some, Suncorp initially sought to accelerate repayment of the loan by proposing that the entirety of the balance be paid between six and 12 months. Mr Lowe sought further assistance from FOS in relation to these negotiations. FOS initially declined to assist him because the case was closed. Mr Lowe brought a fresh complaint to FOS and also raised as part of the complaint an incorrect automated letter <coughs> that the Lowe's received, signed by Mr Carter, setting out minimum repayment amounts for the loan. Mr Lowe gave evidence that the Lowe's felt pressured by Suncorp to withdraw the FOS dispute and the Lowe's subsequently discontinued the proceedings. Mr Lowe gave evidence on how stressful the experience had been for him and said that it had taken its toll on his mother and the rest of his family. Mr Carter gave evidence about Suncorp's decision to refuse Mrs Lowe's offer to repay the loan over its original term on an interest-free basis, characterising it as an interest-free loan spanning 17 years. He said such a proposal was unreasonable and contrary to what he described as an industry practice. Mr Carter gave evidence that it was Suncorp's view that the effect of the determination was to eliminate the loan contract and instead leave what he called a residual debt. Mr Field, the lead ombudsman, gave evidence that FOS does not consider a loan contract in cases of maladministration to be void. Mr Field said that FOS had erred in advising the parties that 12 to 18 months was a reasonable time frame for repayment of the loan. On the evidence, the following findings may be open. Suncorp failed to comply with Clause 27 of the Banking Code of Practice in failing to properly investigate the purpose of the loan, in imprudently assessing the affordability of the loan in a way that was dependent on the development of a commercial property to generate income for repayments, and in failing to control the use of the loan funds. In addition, it may be open to find that Suncorp also failed to comply with the obligations in Clause 3.2 of the Code to act fairly and reasonably in a consistent and ethical manner by conducting its negotiations with Mrs Lowe about a repayment plan for the loan following the FOS determination in a manner that was unfair and unreasonable. On the evidence, Commissioner, it is also open to you to make findings that Suncorp engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations by defending the complaint about the loan in FOS, including by adducing further material to FOS following its recommendation that the loan had been irresponsibly advanced in circumstances where Suncorp ought to have examined and been aware of the loan approval deficiencies and the irrelevance of the material that was adduced. By demanding repayment of the entirety of the loan within an unreasonable time frame, in circumstances where Jennifer Lowe had offered to make regular repayments of the principal in accordance with the loan. By asserting that the loan was void ab initio and should be repaid in priority to the other loans with Suncorp, in circumstances where the FOS determination neither rendered the loan void nor required repayment in priority to other loans, and by communicating with the Lowe's about the loans over a period following Mr Lowe's death in a manner that caused Jennifer and Ryan Lowe distress. The evidence, Commissioner, we submit supports a finding that FOS did not function as an effective mechanism for redress in this case in that neither the recommendation nor the determination made clear that Jennifer Lowe could repay the debt under the loan in accordance with her obligations under the loan contract and in priority to the other loans. Further, FOS then <coughs> told the parties what it considered to be a reasonable period for repayment of the loan, despite Mrs Lowe's offer to make repayments at the same rate or a higher rate than the existing repayment schedule. Suncorp and FOS are each invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings that we have identified as being open to the Commissioner in respect of their respective conduct, as well as any other findings that they regard as being available or open on the evidence. All parties with leave to appear are invited to provide written submissions addressing the following questions which arise from this case study. First, 
if a business loan is determined to have been affected by maladministration, should the financial services provider be permitted to require the loan to be repaid within a time frame shorter than the remaining term of the loan in circumstances where the borrower is willing and able to meet the repayment schedule under the loan? Secondly, could FOS improve its processes for dealing with loans that are determined to have been affected by maladministration? And if so, how? Should the incoming body, AFCA, adopt a different process? Commissioner, the fourth topic to which we now turn is the Bankwest Business Lending Book. As you know, we heard evidence from four customers of Bankwest who had been customers in the period after the takeover of Bankwest by CBA in 2008. And you will recall in opening that we referred to the fact that the conduct of CBA after it purchased Bankwest from HBOS in 2008 has been the subject of significant controversy. We referred to various inquiries that have considered elements of Bankwest's conduct in the period after 19 December 2008, and we specifically addressed what we described as ulterior motive theories. We concluded that the Commission had not seen any evidence from primary sources that supported these theories, and from the review of this evidence, it appeared that the theories were premised on misconceptions in relation to the facts and contractual arrangements to which we referred in opening. We did not intend to repeat what we said in opening. For these case studies, our attention was focused on considering how CBA addressed the risks that it identified in the business loan book after it had acquired Bank West. The four case studies that we selected from the public submissions were intended to explore A, the experiences of those particular customers, and B, the general question of how a bank might legitimately respond to its perception of increased risk in respect of a particular loan or lending in a particular industry, and in what circumstances such conduct might be unconscionable or below community standards. As with other issues, we have considered this by way of case study. And as you appreciate, Commissioner, it is not possible to address each and every public submission that is made. To date, the Commission has received 43 public submissions from former customers of Bank West in the period following the CBA acquisition. It has also received a handful of submissions which were provided directly. The four consumer witnesses from whom we heard evidence were amongst those who had provided public submissions to the Commission. Before examining the case studies in a little detail, it is necessary to make some further observations about the general issue of the state of Bankwest's loan, business loan book. In preparation for exploring these issues at the hearings, the Commission issued a number, I suspect CBA would say many, notices to produce to CBA for contemporaneous documents which would cast light on these issues. Over 13,000 documents were received in response to these notices. Further, the Commission sought and received statements of evidence. Oral evidence was led from Mr David Cohen, CBA's Chief Risk Officer, but also, in relation to a narrower range of issues, from Mr Brett Perry and Mr Peter Clark, both of whom are senior employees at CBA. Through the examination of those internal Bankwest and CBA documents and the evidence of Mr Cohen, we submit that it would be open to you to conclude that the following became apparent to CBA in the period of approximately 18 months after it purchased Bankwest. First, there are indications of problems and serious problems with the quality of the business loan book. Mr Cohen's evidence was that the quality of the Bank West business loan book was not as good as CBA had expected it to be. That is, by March 2009, there had been a notable increase in the concentration of troublesome assets, troublesome assets. And from July 2009 to February 2010, there had been a significant transfer of assets into CAM 
with a value of $1.4 billion. Further, during 2009, the provisions that were being made for the Bankwest business loan book had been increasing. Second, there were indications of problems, and again significant problems, with the diversity of the loan book. That is, Bankwest had a high exposure to commercial property during the period of and immediately after the GFC. Mr Cohen gave evidence that CBA had come to learn that Bankwest had adopted a very aggressive strategy with respect to commercial property Australia-wide, but particularly in relation to property and construction projects and exacerbated on the East Coast. Mr Cohen's evidence was that, in his experience, banks place limits on the concentration of lending in a particular industry as there is value in the diversification of the loan portfolio. And you will recall, Commissioner, that some similar evidence was given last week by Mr Welsh. Further, it is prudent to avoid excessive concentrations in a particular industry in case that industry suffers rapid or even gradual deterioration or decline. Third, there were indications of problems with business functions, including loan management by Bankwest. Mr Cohen's evidence was that it became apparent that some of the relationship managers at Bankwest were not actively monitoring the progress of a loan through its life cycle as they ought to have been. And he said that there were concerns about the operation of the business itself when it was assessing credit. Indeed, by way of example, we heard evidence that up until April or May 2009, Bankwest did not have a watch list process in place to identify loans for which the credit health had started to deteriorate. Fourth, there were indications of problems with aspects of the risk management function, including provisioning. The evidence was that there was an underlying question as to whether the Bankwest business loan portfolio was being credit rated in accordance with the equivalent CBA standard, including concerns about the risk, rate, risk ratings that were given to particular loans. There are also concerns about adequate collective provisioning of the Bankwest business loan book. The evidence that Mr Cohen gave was that as these risks came to light following the acquisition, CBA took steps to address the risks. And that evidence is entirely consistent with the internal documents that we have reviewed. One of those steps was that Bankwest put in place a reduced cap on the commercial property exposure in the business loan book and <coughs> targets to further reduce this exposure over time. Another of those steps was Project Magellan. It was but one of a number of different reviews that were carried out over different aspects of the business loan book. Those reviews occurred in 2009 and 2010. By the time that Project Magellan had been completed, around 60% of the Bankwest business loan book was reviewed. The evidence was that Project Magellan concerned or was concerned with a more accurate assessment of provisioning of the Bankwest <coughs> loan book. And that was required to meet prudential obligations and allow the Commonwealth Bank Group to accurately complete the June 2010 financial statements and report its profit to the market. Mr Cohen's evidence is consistent with what we have observed from our review of extensive contemporaneous documentary evidence. A small fraction of what we have reviewed was tendered during the course of Mr Cohen's evidence. You will recall, Commissioner, from the opening the distinction that we noted between impairment and provisioning on the one hand and default and enforcement on the other. Prim Project Magellan was primarily concerned in the first instance with impairment and provisioning. It will be open to you to conclude, we submit, that a task of the nature of Project Magellan was necessary so as to address the risks that CBA and Bankwest had identified in the Bankwest business loan book following the acquisition. Looking at it in hindsight, CBA had valid concerns about Bankwest's approach to credit writing and account management and was witnessing the continual unexpected, was witnessing continued 
unexpected provisions being made throughout 2009. In this context, the focus of Project Magellan on reviewing part of the loan book that had not, not been identified up until that point in time as troublesome or impaired in order to consider whether further provisioning needed to be made for accurate reporting of the group's end of financial year accounts seems both prudent and responsible. Further... Well, it may be required to give a true and fair view of the accounts. That's right. Uh, to give accounts that... Uh, to file accounts that give a true and fair view, uh, amongst other things, uh, you've got to uh, look at your provisions. That's right. Yes. <coughs> Further, the review of the documentary evidence <coughs> produced to the Commission has not revealed evidence that Project Magellan itself was undertaken with any motive to deliberately make certain types of assessments with respect to particular accounts or particular classes of accounts. It is not open, we submit, on the evidence and on the documents available to find that Project Magellan was intended to be or was intended to be part of a process of deliberately defaulting loans against Bankwest customers. It was in this context that the Commission heard four case studies relating to customer experiences of Bankwest during this period. Each of those case studies had been reviewed as part of Project Magellan. The case studies spanned the range or spectrum of classifications that might have been given as part of that review, green, red and double red. The case studies also spanned industries where CBA had identified risks in the Bankwest loan book, either in relation to the trends within the industry or the size of the Bankwest exposure to property development, land banking and pubs and clubs. And the cases ranged from loans of approximately $1 million, in the case of Mr Stanford, to a very significant business loan of over $50 million taken out by the Doherty Hotels. These case studies have allowed the Commission to hear evidence as to how accounts identified as troublesome or impaired were handled in Bankwest post-acquisition by CBA. The case studies also highlighted some of the issues that arise out of the common terms, covenants and financial undertakings that are included in many business loans. The management of business loan accounts as business conditions or profitability deteriorate and the enforcement of business loans in light of common terms, covenants and financial undertakings included in the business loans, which are relevant, of course, beyond the Bankwest context. Can I now address in turn each of the individual case studies? The first Bankwest case study to which we turn is that of Michael Kelly. His case concerned the terms offered to an existing business customer when renewing or rolling over business facilities, including interest margins, reducing LVR covenants and requiring the payment of upfront interest. As well as hearing evidence from Mr Kelly, the Commission heard evidence from Mr Perry, General Manager of Group Credit Structuring at CBA. Mr Kelly told the Commission about his experiences as a Bankwest business customer in respect of two facilities, both of which were obtained by corporate entities of which he was a director and shareholder, and each of which was secured by land development projects in Western Australia in the period between 2007 and 2012. Mr Kelly's original facilities were not long enough to enable the rezoning or development processes to be finalised, so issues arose when the facilities needed to be renewed. He gave evidence of the fact that he considered that the interest rate margin on the facilities was increased on a number of occasions and only very short facilities were offered as a means of encouraging him to exit his facilities. Further, he pointed to a reduction in the LVR on one of the loans and the reduction of the facility in the other as being motivated for that same purpose of encouraging him to exit. Mr Kelly said that these changes were made after Bankwest informed him that it was looking to reduce its exposure to property development and therefore that it was unlikely that his facilities would be renewed. But he said that at no point 
did either of the companies miss a repayment or interest repayment on either of the loans. In the end, Mr Kelly and his co-investors refinanced in mid-2012 with Bendigo and Adelaide Bank. Mr Perry, on behalf of CBA, gave evidence that at the time the borrower enters into the facility, the borrower ought to understand that the facility has a particular term and that at the expiry of that term, the bank may or may not be willing to refinance. And indeed, if the bank is willing to refinance, it may be on different terms. His evidence was that when loans are extended or rolled over, that these are new contractual arrangements. Mr Perry accepted that Bankwest wanted to exit from the Wild Lions and Silver Suns accounts as soon as it was practically possible to do so by having these companies refinance their loans with another bank. This reflected the general view at the time that Bankwest was overexposed to commercial property. His evidence was that at the relevant time, Bankwest's policy was not to end facilities early, but rather to exit at the end of the term. In this case, that is in the case of Mr Kelly, there had been no early withdrawal as Bankwest had let the facilities run their respective terms. Mr Perry's evidence was also to the effect that the risk grade given to an account would have an effect on the interest rate charged on the facility. But Mr Perry was unable to identify contemporaneous guidelines or models to explain the various interest rate changes that were being applied to the Wild Lines and Silver Sun accounts. As to the period in late 2010 and early 2011, when the facilities were under negotiation, Mr Perry did accept that there were inconsistencies in the information that was given to Mr Kelly about the charging of default interest rates. The second Bankwest case study was that of Mr Stephen Weller, who owned the Nambuka Hotel. His case study highlighted Bankwest's over -reli I'm sorry, Bankwest reliance on non-monetary defaults, including LVR covenants, and a shortening of the loan period after which a deed of forbearance was executed. Those issues arose in a context where there had been no monetary defaults during the course of his facility. Further, the case study raised Bankwest's failure to provide a valuation to the borrower. And you will recall, Commissioner, that it was Mr Peter Clark, the Chief Credit Officer of CBA, that gave evidence in relation to Mr Weller's case. Mr Weller gave evidence about the business facility that Bankwest entered into with Bainbridge Enterprises No. 1, of which Mr Weller was a director, to finance the purchase of the Nambuka Hotel and later to, enable, to advance funds to enable Mr Weller to buy out his partner. The 2008 facility was for a term of 15 years and included non-monetary covenants, but no LVR. Mr Weller and his wife gave personal guarantees for the facilities. Mr Weller's evidence was that in 2010, which was the conclusion of an initial interest-free period on the 2008 facility, he was offered a varied facility by Bankwest, although this offer reduced the term of the loan to two years. In his evidence about negotiations following this offer, Mr Weller accepted that he had been offered a facility with the original 15-year expiry date reinstated, but that after further negotiations over interest rate and principal repayments to levels that were acceptable and affordable to him, the offer he eventually signed was a 12-month facility. He was concerned that the maintenance of the 15-year term would have resulted in significantly higher interest rates being incurred. Despite a downturn in trading in 2010 and beyond, Mr Weller's evidence, which was accepted by Bankwest, was that he was never in default of any monetary payments owed under the facility. In the latter part of 2012, Bankwest informed Mr Weller and his wife of the need for an updated valuation of the hotel and the need to reduce the principal on any new facility. <coughs> in response, Bankwest organised a valuation and Mr Weller engaged an agent to sell some of the hotel's poker machines and he and his wife put their residential home on the market. Their home had never been security for the facility. Mr Weller's evidence was that he met with Bankwest in December 2012, by which time he understood Bankwest had a draft of the valuation but would not provide him with a copy. <coughs>
It was also at this meeting that Mr Weller said that Bankwest told him that they were not prepared to roll over the facility because there was insufficient time and that Bainbridge would need to enter into a deed of forbearance with the bank. Mr Weller's evidence was that he received the first draft of this deed of forbearance two days before the facility was due to expire. The deed of forbearance was entered into two weeks later. However, Bankwest shortly thereafter notified Mr Weller of a breach of its terms. Over the next three years, Mr Weller and Bankwest were involved in a FOS dispute before receivers were appointed and ultimately the personal guarantee given by Mr Weller was called upon by Bankwest, resulting in a settlement. The evidence of Mr Weller raised three main issues to which Mr Clark responded on behalf of the Commonwealth Bank. First, the lack of transparency around the final valuation of the hotel. Secondly, the shortening of the term of the facility through a series of variations to the facility. And thirdly, the relationship between breaches of financial covenants and the entry into the deed of forbearance. Mr Clark agreed that if significant decisions are made in relation to a customer's financial commitments without the customer being shown the valuation, there is a lack of transparency. Mr Clark's evidence was that it was no longer the policy of CBA to withhold valuations from customers who have paid for the valuation. Indeed, Mr Clark said that it just seems a fair thing to do. As to the length of the facilities, Mr Clark explained that banks prefer shorter term facilities as longer term facilities come with higher risks. Quite simply, he explained that over time, more things could go wrong if the facility is longer. Further, he explained that the inclusion of financial covenants such as ICR and DSR ratios is part of prudent management of a business loan as it allows monitoring of the business and comparison to forecasts and expectations. As to the breaches of non-monetary covenants generally, Mr Clark's evidence was that it was very rare in his experience for a bank to actually call a default and demand repayment as a result of a breach of one of the financial ratio covenants alone. This is a matter upon which Mr Cohen also gave evidence and we will come to that in due course. The third case study was that of Michael Doherty. Mr Doherty's case study concerned the effect of changes in a bank's approach to valuation of secured property and what that may have on a decision not to renew the facility. The Commission heard evidence from Mr Doherty himself and Mr Clark also responded to that evidence. Mr Doherty gave evidence in relation to a business facility that he obtained in 2008 from Bankwest for approximately $50 million, which was used to develop a hotel in Hobart. Ultimately, the development project was not completed before receivers were appointed in 2012. A focus of the case study was upon the use of valuations of the development by Bankwest in its decision making <coughs> with respect to the facility, in particular, where the facility was initially offered and several years later when Bankwest was making decisions about whether to extend or renew the facilities. The development was a complex hotel and retail development and the evidence before the Commission demonstrated that there were various approaches that could be taken to valuation of the property. Mr Doherty's evidence was that he had understood that when the facility was offered in 2008, the development was valued on a mixed use basis meaning the various components of the development were assessed by reference to their different functions. That was in contrast to an approach of valuing the hotel on one line, which would have resulted in a lower valuation. Mr Doherty's evidence was that he understood that the mixed use valuation must have been relied upon because the offer included a 65% LVR covenant, which would not have been satisfied from the outset without relying on the higher valuation. Mr Clark conceded that when the facilities were approved by Bankwest, the, document sho the documentation showed that a mixed use valuation had been <coughs> used in the approval process. Mr Doherty gave evidence that in July 2011, Bankwest decided not to extend the facilities, despite the fact that the project was very close to completion and would soon be operational. Receivers were appointed about six months later. Mr Doherty complained that Bankwest had received a valuation which Bankwest had insisted on being done on an 
in one line basis. And Mr Doherty's evidence was that he had raised his concerns about Bankwest's choice of valuation method on multiple occasions with Bankwest and directly with the valuer because he was concerned about the approach and the possibility of undervaluation of the property. Mr Doherty's evidence was that he was not given a copy of the valuation once it was completed, although he was told by a Bankwest staff member that it was a contributing factor in Bankwest's decision not to extend the facility. Mr Clark accepted that although in earlier decision-making processes Bankwest had been prepared to rely on the mixed-use method of valuation, Bankwest's position had changed by 2011. Mr Clark did not know why the approach had changed. Mr Clark's evidence was that ultimately the valuation method adopted in the July 2011 valuation did not have a bearing on the outcome of the Doherty account. While Mr Clark said that he had no basis on which to question Mr Doherty's evidence that he had been told by a Bankwest staff member that the valuation put the facility in breach of the LVR covenant, his review of the file had revealed no formal notice of breach. Moreover, his evidence was that the high LVR was not itself the reason that the facility was not renewed. Rather, there were concerns about money owed to creditors, the time for completion, and the relationship with the borrower, and these ultimately informed Bankwest's decision not to renew or renegotiate the facility. Mr Clark did accept that it would have been a fair thing to do to show the valuation to Mr Doherty. Mr Clark's evidence was that Bankwest ultimately lost $38 million in respect of this account. The fourth and final Bankwest case study was that of Mr Brendan Stanford, who operated the Coronation Hotel. This case study concerned CBA's reliance on non-monetary default clauses to exit a connection which was being financially maintained and also the use of investigative accountants. In this case study, the Commission heard evidence from both Mr Stanford and also from Mr Cullen. Brendan Stanford and his brother, Michael, entered into a banking relationship with Bankwest in 2006 to purchase the hotel. They borrowed $1.2 million to assist with the purchase price of $1.6 million. In 2010, the Commonwealth Bank became concerned about the fat falling value of the hotel. Even though the Stanfords had made all principal and interest repayments due under the business loan, the bank began to issue breach letters for non-monetary defaults relating to reporting covenants and DSR and ICR covenant breaches. Although the bank acknowledged the Stanford's first class repayment history, in light of the non-monetary covenant breaches, the bank made a decision to exit the banking relationship. The commission heard evidence from Mr Cohen that non-monetary defaults, in particular breaches of financial ratios, are powerful indicators of trouble to come and that the bank anticipated financial breaches based on the non-monetary defaults. The Commission heard that the bank did not adequately communicate its position in respect of non-monetary defaults and did not adequately communicate why those non-monetary defaults had led the bank to conclude that the only viable option was to sell the hotel. The Commission heard evidence that in the second half of 2011, Bankwest appointed PPB advisory as investigative accountants to produce a report on the state of the business at the hotel. The Commission heard evidence that Mr Stanford had no, had no recollection of PPB advisory being appointed, or I beg your pardon, had no knowledge of PPB, being advi of PPB advisory being appointed until he received a telephone call from his brother. The Stanford brothers subsequently received correspondence from Bankwest's lawyer at the beginning of November 2011, which gave the Stanford seven days to acknowledge whether there had been a material adverse change in the financial condition of the hotel based on the investigative accountant's report. The letter also required the Stanfords to pay the fees of $9,900 within seven days. It did not enclose a copy of the investigative accountant's report and the Stanfords never received a copy of the investigative account accountant's report. The Stanfords engaged legal representation 
who wrote to the bank's lawyers to ask for a copy of the report and the invoice for the work, neither were provided to the Stanfords. This conduct arose because at the relevant time, the CBA policy regarding investigative accountants was that it was appropriate to not provide the investigative accountant report to the Stanfords and to only provide them with seven days notice, but that policy has now changed and the policy of the bank is that 30 days notice ought to be given and also that parts of the investigative accountant's <coughs> report should be, a, should be provided to the borrower. The Commission heard evidence from Mr Cohen that in his view it was unfair of CBA to only give the Stanfords seven days to respond to the matters raised in the report, to ask the Stanfords to respond to concerns raised in the report when that report was not provided to them, to only provide the Stanfords with seven days to pay the costs, to make the Stanfords pay for a report with which they had not been provided, and to not be fully transparent or engage in open discussions with the Stanfords as to the bank's intention to sell the hotel. Based on the evidence of Mr Cohen, under the current CBA policy, as we have said, the bank will provide 30 days for a customer to respond and the bank would provide a copy of the report <coughs> in most but not all circumstances and not necessarily including all of the report. The Commission heard each of Mr Clark and Mr Cohen acknowledge that the bank's failure to provide valuations or investigative, investigative accountants' reports fell below what was expected and was now the subject of different policies. Further, in relation to Mr Stanford, Mr Cohen conceded that there was a lack of open and transparent engagement with the borrowers, which fell below community <coughs> expectations. It is apparent, however, that any such admissions do not amount to admissions of misconduct, and we do not suggest to you, Commissioner, that there are any open findings of misconduct in relation to these case studies. As well as the matters which were conceded by CBA's witnesses, it would also be open to the Commissioner, that is to you, to conclude that the conduct of CBA in relation to each of the four witnesses involved errors of communication and transparency which are below community standards and expectations. CBA is invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings that we have identified to be open, as well as any other findings that it regards as available in the evidence. Some of the issues raised by these case studies have relevance to business lending more generally. And in light of this, all parties given leave to, leave to appear are invited to provide written submissions addressing the following questions. <coughs> First, how, if at all, are banks to deal with circumstances in which, for reasons extraneous to the conduct of the borrower, the bank no longer wishes to fund a particular business or industry? That is, what is the bank to do if, for example, the market has changed such that its security is no longer adequate? What are the obligations, if any, on a bank in those circumstances? Secondly, is there any reason why valuations or investigative accountants' reports would not be provided to customers in circumstances in which the reports have been paid for by the customer and the bank wishes to take reliance, at least in part, on such reports? Is there any reason why such transparency obligations should be limited by the size of the loan or limited to providing only parts of the report? Thirdly, is it appropriate for a bank to take enforcement action where no monetary defaults have occurred and the bank can rely only on non-monetary defaults? Why or why not? Should there be some additional protection for borrowers in these circumstances and ought the bank be obliged to explain such matters? The fifth topic to which we now turn, Commissioner. And I think also arising out of uh, those is, is there a disconnection between what the banks are saying in their advertising, their annual reports, uh, their other public documents, and their conduct? Yes, Commissioner. And if there is a disconnection between them, what if anything follows from that? 
The answer may be nothing follows from it. I don't know. But uh, are customers uh, to place any significance upon uh, statements of the kind to which I think I referred in the course of, was it Mr Cohen's evidence or someone else's evidence? It's certainly somebody's evidence. I'm so glad you remember it with that degree of precision. It's about the degree of precision I've got at the moment. Mr Hodge, I'm sorry, but I think that the parties will know what I'm referring to. Yes, Commissioner. We might call that a fourth question, if that's convenient. <laughs> Commissioner, the fifth topic to which we now turn is power and communication. And we will address two case studies as part of this topic. The first case study concerns Bank of Melbourne's withholding of funds in a term deposit to correct an error made by the bank. The Commission heard evidence from Bradley Wallace, one of the directors of Thur, and Alistair Welsh, the General Manager of Commercial Banking at Westpac. In June 2016, Thur obtained two loans from Bank of Melbourne, an investment property loan to refinance an existing mortgage over an investment property, and the Biobara loan by a barrow loan to purchase a property at By Barrow in New South Wales. There was an existing business operating from that property. In the loan application form, Mr. and Mrs. Wallace indicated that the loan was for the purpose of purchasing a property with a house and business located on it. The loan application was supported by a projected profit and loss statement for the business. The Commission heard evidence that before the loan was approved, the banker, the banker's regional manager, and the bank's credit mortgage team were all aware of the fact that there was a business operating on the property. The Commission also heard evidence that both the banker and his manager stood to gain financially through potential bonuses if the loan was approved. <coughs> At the relevant time, the banker's performance targets were heavily weighted towards financial performance. Despite the commercial nature of the property, the bank approved the loan as a residential loan. Following the failure of the business in two June 2013, Thur asked the bank to revalue the investment property and the Biobara property. The Bank of Melbourne's credit team identified that the property had been characterised as a residential loan when it should have been characterised as commercial. Later, upon the sale of the investment property, the bank refused to discharge the mortgage over the investment property unless $100,000 of the proceeds from the sale was deposited and held in a Bank of Melbourne term deposit account pending the restructure of the other loan from a residential loan to a commercial facility so as to make up for the security shortfall that would exist if the loan was reclassified. After Mr Wallace questioned the bank's entitlement to withhold these funds, the bank told Mr Wallace that the loan documents gave the bank the ability to control the flow of any settlement fund in relation to discharging securities. Mr Welsh's evidence was that it was for the bank's credit team, or it was the bank's credit team that had made the decision to withhold the funds and that there was no evidence that the bank had relied on legal advice before making this decision or communicating it to Mr Wallace. Mr Wallace submitted a complaint to FOS. FOS considered that the bank had incorrectly advanced the buy barrel loan as a residential loan. Although FOS considered that the bank was entitled under the terms of its mortgage memorandum of provisions to retain part of the sale proceeds of the investment property, FOS considered that in the circumstances it was not fair for the bank to do so. In his evidence, Mr Welsh agreed that the clauses of the mortgage memorandum relied on by the bank to justify withholding the $100,000 from Mr and Mrs Wallace were too complex for a customer to understand. Mr Welsh also agreed that in withholding these funds, the bank had not acted in accordance with these clauses. Mr Welsh accepted that the bank retain, retained the $100,000 as a bargaining chip to get Mr and Mrs Wallace to agree to restructure the loan and in withholding these funds, the bank had acted unfairly. On the evidence, the following findings may be open with respect to the Bank of Melbourne. First, that by requiring the loan to be restructured in 2017 and retaining the $100,000 Bank of Melbourne breached Clause 3.2 of the Code of Banking Practice in failing to act fairly and reasonably towards Thur and Mr and Mrs Wallace in a consistent and ethical manner. Secondly, 
by representing that it had a legal entitlement to withhold $100,000 from Mr and Mrs Wallace in a term deposit account in circumstances in which the mortgage memorandum of provisions only permitted this to be done where the $100,000 was to be used to pay down the buyer bar loan, the Bank of Melbourne engaged in conduct which was misleading or deceptive in contravention of Section 12, capital D, capital A of the ASIC Act. It may also be open, Commissioner, to find that in representing to Thur and Mr and Mrs Wallace, the bank had a legal entitlement to withhold the $100,000, and in withholding these funds from Thur and Mr and Mrs Wallace to rectify the bank's own security shortfall, the Bank of Melbourne engaged in conduct that fell short of community standards and expectations. Before we turn to the next case study, we make a general observation, which is that this and other case studies considered during the hearings highlight that the lower level of, that the lower level of regulation over business lending, as opposed to consumer lending, means that there is a particular need to be, for banks to be mindful of not focusing on relentlessly acquiring new business. The danger of that type of selling model was identified particularly in relation to the case studies involving ANZ, Westpac and the Bank of Queensland. All parties with leave to appear are invited to provide written submissions addressing the following questions, which arise from several of the case studies in relation to the sales culture for business loans. First, should the sales culture for small business reflect that of consumer lending in that business bankers are discouraged from focusing primarily on financial incentives in their key performance indicators. Secondly, specifically in relation to this case study, should lenders be required to clearly draw the cross collateralization clauses and its effects to the attention of borrowers? If so, how should this be done? Westpac, I should say, is also invited to specifically address the findings that we have submitted may be open and any other findings that it considers may be open on the evidence. The next case study concerned the failure of communication by the National Australia Bank to Ross Dillon of the NAB's intention to use all of the surplus proceeds from the sale of Goanna Downs, which was Mr Dillon's home and the property that provided security for a personal guarantee that had been given by him and his wife <coughs> in respect of the business facilities of National Music. The Commission heard evidence from Mr Dillon, who made a public submission to the Commission, Mr Bassett, a former employee of NAB, and Mr Ross McNaughton, the current General Manager of the Strategic Business Services Division at NAB. The evidence was that, from as early as 2011, Mr Dillon had discussed with the NAB his intention to sell Goanna Downs and use the proceeds to inject funds into national music and to purchase a smaller property in Melbourne so as to be closer to his children and future grandchildren. In March 2015, Mr Dillon met with Mr Bassett and informed Mr Bassett of his intention to sell Goanna Downs and inject around $200,000 to $300,000 into national music. It was also Mr Dillon's evidence that he said to Mr Bassett that he then intended to purchase a new home in Melbourne. Mr Bassett did not discuss with Mr Dillon what NAB's expectations were in respect of the sale proceeds. Mr Bassett recalls meeting Mr Dillon on this date, but does not recall the details of the discussion. Nor did the NAB inform Mr Dillon that it would require further security in the event that Goanna Downs was sold. Mr McNaughton, on behalf of the National Australia Bank, considered that the lack of communication between his bank and Mr Dillon regarding the bank's expectations in respect of the sale proceeds was not an example of poor communication between the bank and its customers. After Mr Dillon sold Goanna Downs on 30 April 2015, for $2.22 million, Mr Dillon was informed that the bank would be retaining the entire sale proceeds from Goanna Downs, with the funds remaining after repayment of the mortgage to be put towards reducing the overall debt position of national music. 
At no time was national music in monetary default in respect of the facilities with the NAB. At no time had the bank made a call under the guarantee. The Commission heard evidence from Mr Bassett that at no time prior to 30 April 2015 was Mr Bassett aware that the bank intended to take all of the sale proceeds from Goanna Downs to reduce the facilities of national music. Mr Bassett conceded that the SBS manager at the time, Ms Moynihan, informed him of the plan to use all of the sale proceeds to reduce debts owed by the company National Music after the sale contract had been signed. Mr McNaughton admitted that the NAB did not have a right to apply the proceeds from, of sale from Goanna Downs to National Music's facilities. He also admitted that the communication could have been better by NAB to inform Mr Dillon before the sale as to first what the bank would like to do with the sale proceeds and secondly what the bank would require in respect of its security position going forward. Mr McNaughton's evidence was that despite the failure of the bank to communicate with Mr Dillon its intention to take the entire proceeds of sale, it had acted with integrity towards Mr Dillon and treated Mr Dillon with respect and courtesy as required under the SBS governing principles. It is open to you, Commissioner, to find that NAB might have engaged in misleading or deceptive conduct. First, the bank did not inform Mr Dillon that the intentions he had expressed to the bank in respect of the proceeds of sale would not be possible because the bank would require either all of the <coughs> surplus to reduce the debts of national music or an alternative proposal of security from him. Second, the bank represented to Mr Dillon that it was entitled to use the proceeds of sale to reduce the debts of national music in circumstances in which the bank has now acknowledged that it did not have the legal right to do so. The bank's failure to communicate its expectations and intentions to Mr Dillon may also have been a breach of clause 3.2 of the Code of Banking Practice in that it may have failed to act in a consistent and ethical manner. NAB's conduct also fell below community standards and expectations. Despite Mr McNaughton's evidence to the contrary, it is open to you to find that the relevant NAB bankers may not have adhered to NAB's policies, which required them to engage early with Mr Dillon, to be open and honest with him, and to clearly articulate the bank's position and the basis of the decision. NAB is invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings that we have identified to be open to you, as well as any other findings that it regards as available on the evidence. All parties with leave to appear are invited to provide written submissions addressing the following question. When and how much disclosure should a bank provide a director of a business in respect of a decision of the bank's workout division, in this case the SBS division of NAB, where that decision will affect a customer's use of a personal asset which indirectly secures the obligations of their business to the bank. Commissioner, we finally turn to the sixth topic, which is regulation and self-regulation of the SME lending sector. Your terms of reference require you to inquire into the effectiveness and ability of regulators of financial services entities to identify and address misconduct by those entities. In this final section, we will deal with some evidence from the regulator and the peak industry body about some aspects of their roles in relation to small business lending. The Commission has heard evidence from a number of witnesses about the review of the Code of Banking Practice, which is a form of self-regulation by the banking industry, and which our case studies have shown is one of the only sources of conduct obligations on banks in relation to small business. Philip Curry gave evidence as the opening witness of this round of hearings about his role as the independent reviewer of the current 2013 version of the code. He gave evidence of the strong view expressed to him by small business representatives that the recommendations of his review would have to be significant or transformational in nature to have any prospect of overcoming scepticism in the community towards the banking industry. 
the revised draft of the code, which emerged after Mr Curry's review, has also gone into evidence. It includes for the first time a section or sections dealing specifically with small business. Mr Curry expressed disappointment with parts of this draft, including the definition of small business, protections afforded to guarantors and the accessibility of the code for small business customers. The Commission also heard evidence from the CEO of the Australian Banking Association, Anna Bly, about the ABA's approach to Mr Curry's recommendations and the ABA's request that ASIC approve the code under its regulatory guide 183, which the ABA believed would reassure customers. The evidence given to the Commission identified that the principal point of contention remaining between the ABA and ASIC in respect of the draft code is the definition of small business. The ABA's position is that the definition of small business should only extend to businesses with a total debt of $3 million or less to all credit providers, while ASIC had raised the question of whether the small business definition should extend to businesses with a total debt of $5 million or less. Ms Bly considered that what constituted the two ends of the spectrum of small and large businesses was understood, but that what remained was to find an appropriate middle. The Commission heard from Ms Bly that there are a number of reasons for the ABA taking their current position, including that borrowers with facilities above $3 million tended to be more sophisticated and have access to commercial and legal advice. She also noted that a higher threshold may create a competitive disadvantage for smaller banks, as it may result in a loss of control over the entirety or near entirety of their loan books due to the consumer protections contained in relation to non-monetary defaults and financial indicator covenants in the code. She also said that placing limits on enforcement or default-based actions, as the code would do, may increase the risk for a bank to make a loan, which consequently may be factored into the price of facilities or the willingness of the bank to extend credit at all. The Commission also heard evidence this morning from Mr Sadat, a senior executive leader and regional commissioner of ASIC, that the contrary position put forward by some stakeholders is that a $5 million threshold is more appropriate. The evidence of Ms Bly is that ABA is intending to market test the effect of the changes and is willing to undergo a two-year review supervised by ASIC. The new code has not been approved by ASIC as at today. It was submitted for approval over five months ago. Ms Bly and Mr Sadat have both said that the ABA and ASIC are, awa are waiting until the conclusion of this round of hearings in case any issues will be raised that should be considered by the parties before the finalisation of the code. The Commission also heard evidence about the implementation of the unfair contract provisions in the ASIC Act, which were extended to small businesses on the 12th of November 2016, and the regulator's response to those changes. The Commission yesterday heard evidence from Suncorp about the work they had done to amend their standard form business contracts to comply with changes in law. In that regard, the evidence of Mr Kluss, Suncorp's Executive General Manager of Lending, was that Suncorp had not yet completed its review of its small business sta standard contracts, despite early and ongoing engagement with ASIC. Mr Kluss admitted that it had taken Suncorp over two years since the legislation passed to amend a limited number of standard form business contracts. He said that the reason for the delay was due to the number of credit contracts being reviewed, but he admitted that Suncorp's processes had taken too long. The evidence of Westpac and other banks on their compliance with the UCT regime was also tendered into evidence. The unfair contract terms regime in the ASIC Act relates to financial services and is therefore the responsibility of ASIC. But as you know, and as we explained in opening, the ACCC is responsible for the unfair contract term regime in the Australian consumer law, which deals with all other parts of the Australian economy. The Commission heard evidence from both regulators, both ASIC and the ACCC, which revealed a different approach to implementation and enforcement of these new provisions. Yesterday, 
Scott Gregson, the Executive General Manager of Consumer Enforcement at the ACCC, told the Commission that once the amending legislation was passed, I'm sorry, once the amending legislation took effect on the 12th of November 2016, the ACCC moved into an enforcement mode, although it had engaged with the relevant industries in the lead up to that date, including by way of contract reviews and publishing a report a few days before the legislation took effect. That is consistent with the ACCC's approach to compliant, which uses, compliance, which uses enforcement as one of its effective tools to ensure broader compliance in the industry. Commissioner, this morning you heard evidence from Mr Sadat and Mr Malali of ASIC in relation to ASIC's approach to enforcement of the UCT and more generally we don't propose, given how recently you heard that evidence, to summarise that evidence again. Consideration of all of the evidence in relation to the code, the UCT and the protective provisions of the ASIC Act raises the following general questions to which all parties given leave to appear are invited to make submissions. First, is ASIC's approach to the UCT provisions and the consumer protection provisions under the ASIC Act more generally, appropriate and moulded to the risks of the contraventions and the practical resources constraints on ASIC. Secondly, has ASIC's approach been effective in ensuring compliance with the UCT provisions that came into effect in November 2016 and the consumer protection provisions of the ASIC Act generally? Thirdly, is the proposed code, whether or not it is approved by ASIC, adequate to address any residual concerns about the coverage of obligations imposed on the banks? Would the absence of ASIC approval undermine the effectiveness of the code? Commissioner, that concludes Mr. our Can I closing add to submissions. Questions one and two of those general questions, Mr. Hodge. Um, is ASIC's approach to various things appropriate? Has ASIC's approach to various things been effective? Uh, the utility of the submissions will uh, depend very much on whether the parties go beyond simply uh, assertion one way or the other. Uh, simply saying yes it is, no it isn't, uh, is not going to be particularly enlightening. Uh, according to whichever uh, stance is taken uh, or uh, if no stance is taken, if a party seeks to say we don't know, we can't say, we don't wish to say, uh, I will be much assisted uh, if the parties explain and seek to justify whatever may be the position they adopt. Simply saying yes or no doesn't help. Simply saying I have nothing to say about this subject without saying why the party thinks it either cannot or should not will be uh, not as helpful as it may be. So uh, I know uh, what I'm asking is difficult, but the questions are difficult. Therefore, uh, whatever assistance the parties can give will be valued, but no less importantly, the greater the extent to which the parties can justify their position by reasoned argument, the more likely it is to be persuasive. Commissioner, before we adjourn, there are some documents, the list of documents that we need to tender. Yes, there's that and then there's a couple of housekeeping things about submissions, dates and time. So what do we do first? The joys of tendering documents? Could we just... Oh, I've handed up, or hopefully it's being handed up to you, a list of documents. These are documents that were, in most cases, referred to during the course of the hearing and the day on which they were referred to is noted, but the document itself wasn't tendered at the time and then there are a couple of extra documents including a statement of a NAB witness 
that ought to be tendered as well. Would it be convenient? That's the statement of Mr. Selby. That's correct. Would it be convenient, having handed that up to you, Commissioner, we could just publish that on the website if you'd prefer? And uh, it should be published. Yes. Uh, and it, uh, uh, the documents that are identified there can be received and numbered sequentially in the. Uh, uh, sequence of exhibit numbering, but it will be as well that they are published so that uh, parties and others can see what it is that's been put in. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. And then housekeeping matters. Um, yes, more than perhaps housekeeping. Um, firstly, times for submissions uh, and uh, length of submissions. Uh, as to the case study submissions, as in past case study Oh, as in past rounds of evidence, case study submissions uh, of not more than 20 pages uh, should be uh, provided no later than 4 p.m. on Friday next, 8 June, uh, by those who are the immediate parties to the case studies. So 20 page uh, limits there. The general submissions, uh, uh, bearing in mind that uh, Monday 11 is uh, Queen's birthday, uh, should be made available by 12 noon, no later than 12 noon, Tuesday 12 June. And having regard to uh, the uh, nature of uh, the questions uh, that have been raised, uh, parties may have up to 30 pages uh, to make their submissions uh, on those subjects, the general uh, uh, questions that have been raised in the course of running. Can I say something uh, about documents that parties uh, refer to in their written submissions? It's an issue that's arisen uh, in the last two rounds of hearings. Uh, it is my expectation that the documents that a party refer refers to in its written submissions will be restricted to the documents that have been tendered in evidence during the course of the public hearings. Uh, all parties who have leave to appear uh, have and have had uh, the opportunity to seek leave to tender documents during the course of the hearings. And if a party uh, and, and therefore, I would ordinarily expect that uh, the record is now complete. If contrary to that, and a party wishes to refer to a document in its written submissions that was not tendered in evidence during the course of the hearings, that party will need to submit an application to tender the document and a submission as to why the document, which will explain why the document was not tendered during the public hearing, but should now uh, be tendered. If a document uh, is received in evidence as a result of that process, that document will be published on the website along with the other documents tendered during the course of the public hearing. We need to come back always to the fact that this is a public inquiry and things are to be done uh, like that in public with a public record where people can ultimately, I know it takes time, but can ultimately uh, look at the exhibits that have been tendered. I should also add for the avoidance of doubt, though I think Suncorp will be uh, advised specifically of this fact. Uh, I've received, or well, the solicitors to the Commission have received communication from Consumer Action Law Centre uh, putting in issue uh, some uh, statements which uh, they would say uh, were attributed to them in the course of Mr Morgan's evidence. Uh, CALC will uh, have leave to make general submissions on the issues uh, that uh, were thus raised. They are issues about uh, FOS's treatment uh, of uh, uh, the uh, remedies that would be given in cases where there is maladministration or found to be maladministration of a loan. Uh, 
again, as I say, those things should be recorded publicly as well as uh, simply observed from the fact of the submissions. Now, is there anything else that arises, Mr Hodge? No, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Um, we will adjourn until the next round of hearings, which is in Brisbane. Thank you. Thank you.